The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Schroeder Investment Management Australia Limited, ABN 22000443274, AFSL 226473, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Ready to establish a consistent approach to investing that brings rigour to your team and clarity to your clients? Welcome to the Ensemble Investment Philosophies in Action series. I'm Peter diamond and I'm here to bring you practical insights straight from Australia's top financial advisors. In this series, we cut through the noise and focus on the essential steps to building and then executing a powerful investment philosophy. Hear firsthand from our guests as they share real-world challenges and triumphs, giving you clear, actionable strategies to implement in your own practice. Tune in to the Investment Philosophies in Action series and elevate your financial advising with a philosophy that truly resonates with your clients. For six decades, Schroeder's Australia's investment expertise and agility has helped deliver consistent long-term returns for their local clients. With one of Australia's most experienced on-the-ground research teams, backed by over 220 years of compounded knowledge of global financial markets, Schroeder's clients continue to benefit from their proven investment approach, deep wisdom, and focus on investing beyond tomorrow. Schroeder's Australia manages assets for institutional and wholesale clients across Australian equities, fixed income, multi-asset, and global private market strategies, including private equity. Hello and welcome to this very special Ensemble podcast mini-series where we're diving into the practical application of an investment philosophy through the experience of advice practitioners and investment gurus from within the Ensemble network. Now, I'm Peter Dumantidis and the guest joining me here today is based in the nation's capital, Canberra, is a partner and financial advisor with Callaghan's Accountants and has his CFP. Welcome, Leong Tang, and thank you so much for agreeing to share your investment philosophy journey with us. Thanks, Peter. And um, yeah, it's my pleasure. <laughs> we'll, we'll dive in, will we? So this is episode three um, of the series. And our focus for this episode is actually capturing, you know, the benefits and the challenges of having an investment philosophy. So this is sort of, you know, the job's done, it's been implemented, you know, how did things go? So just to Give us a little context to begin with so people can sort of understand where you're coming from. I think that's really important. In terms of your background, you know, did what was your first specialty in financial advice? Were you, you know, focused on the investments? Were you a risk advisor? Who were you when you first started in financial advice? Um, Peter, just I, I guess it's um it's a bit of an unorthodox way that I started in financial advice. Um, it was almost serendipitous that I kind of fumbled into financial advice. Mm-hmm. Um, I did my degree in accounting and finance, mm-hmm. um, did a master's of financial management, um, thought that finance was all about investments, actually. Right. Um, and then I realized that um, that actually branches and extends way beyond that because, yeah, but unfortunately, universities don't don't really teach you that. <laughs> you know? They don't, um, do they? Yeah, not, not enough. Like, um, So I guess- the way that I started in financial advice, it's um, from the fact that I just wanted to get into the finance finance industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought that, okay, this is something that is remotely related to what I've studied. Um, I do have an extreme passion for finance um, okay. in general. And um, yeah, that's that's my route and, um, and my story of how I Started Stumbled into the yeah, into, into the industry, <laughs> tripped and landed in financial advice. I so know. <laughs> <laughs> so then, just to sort of clarify um, the type of uh, not so much advisor, but your interests. You know, some people. You know, I've chatted to advisors who I would call are uh, you know extreme investment hobbyists. In that, even in their spare time, you know, they've got the six screens up on the walls and they're following all the international markets. Like they're deeply into it. Where yeah. would you put yourself on that spectrum? What's your take? on that? Is this something that you're absolutely, you know, do and, and value for clients, but it's not something that, you know, say outside of work you're interested in? Where do you sit on that sort of range? 
Um, look, Peter, I think personally, I I I, I fall into that category. Um, yes. I, I, um, I think I think my partner is a bit sick and tired of me looking at the pre market movements for the US market before I, I go to sleep, and okay. I look at how the markets have closed overnight. Um, where the, yep. the first thing that I get up, um, and I, I guess, but that's that's quite different. That that comes with uh, my personal preference and mm-hmm. personal hobby, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. But in terms of my professional life, I don't really talk too much about that. If clients want to have a, have a chat, I would make it very clear that that is um, totally separate of for, you know from what we look at in terms of oh you know overarching and strategic financial planning. Mm. Um, that that kind of stems um, that kind of it's a good segue into one small little segment of our investment philosophy as well because. Um, part of it, it's the fact that we um, quite unremorsefully tell our clients that returns do not have to come from investments. Yep. So, um, yeah, the best investment returns gets you 10, 20, 30%. If you, it, you know, through things like trading, um, it can actually get, give you 50, 60% returns. However, you know, if you get, if you save a dollar from your cash flow, guess what? It's 100% return on your money, tax free, risk free. So, right. no one beats that, not even Warren Buffett, not, not Peter Lynch. No. Um, and and nope. that's where um, I see a lot of value of, um, of just looking at it from a higher level and thinking of things a bit more strategically and the investments. Um, that's, that's, that comes a lot of through a lot of layers down from um, the strategic financial planning. Um, that we do absolutely, and it's 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 such an important point, isn't it? Because I mean, I'm sure you've had this happen to you. You'll go to an event or you know a wedding or a barbecue or something, and somebody asks, "Yeah, what's your hot tip? What's your like? Find out what you're doing." Oh, what's your hot tip? And I always sort of lean in and really sort of you know build it up and like spend less than you earn. <laughs> and they look at you and I'm like, I'm not being a smart ass. Like that's the single biggest thing you could ha- do to impact your future, you know? And I, I, yeah. it's, it's I, so I do big. tell some of my mates about that as well, Peter, um, that I, like when people ask me what, uh, what are the full, like what are the few things that we, I do for my personal financial planning, I tell them that I tax plan, I look at my cash flow, I, um, I trade a bit on the side, mm-hmm. I invest heavily but I, out of those four, I would actually happily give up three out of four of them because the one skill that I have, it's cash flow. And yeah. it's all about just knowing a dollar coming in and a dollar going out of a bank yeah. account because the value that you get from that trumps the value that the other three can put together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but, but- so the, for the purpose of our discussion then, just to anchor people, you've um, we're going to be talking about sort of the benefits and what you've seen roll out of, of really pulling together a concise investment philosophy. But I'm just curious for people, you know, where did you guys land? What was the sort of headline description of, of the philosophy? Um, you know, I believe it was some sort of version of a core satellite approach. Is that, I mean, I'm really simplifying here, but, yep. but is that sort of where you landed? What was the, what was the end result of all of that analysis? Analysis and sort of uh, navel gazing that you must have done to yeah. pull it together. I think you've hit the nail on its head, Peter. That um, it's it's pretty hard to simplify this into a few sentences. Yeah. Because, um, yeah. A version of a core satellite. It's um, it's 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 kind of like you know a, a very very simplistic summary. Yeah. Um, because on that we we take um, essentially a. a a very very sensible approach yep. in 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 our eyes, um, and the reason why I say that it's a core satellite, it's because we don't we don't take it for granted that um, what should be in a core and what should be in a satellite, because that's not exactly part of our like the core satellite approach is not part of our investment philosophy, mm-hmm. but it's more around asset alloca- allocation. Beautiful. How you allocate your assets that can be determined by um, by what the current market conditions are. Mm-hmm. But that DAO with philosophy stems from asset location. Yep. Um, put simply, and this is the same rhetoric that we give our clients, it's just making sure that you have the right amount of money in the right types of assets. Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect, perfect. So how long have, like when did you sort of go through this process where you sort of, you know, took the time to really enunciate that and narrow it down, I guess, from something that might have just been in your brain and, and yeah. you just applied to each client? When when did you undertake that work? Um, embarrassingly, Peter, I think that was left in the advisor's head um, in Caligans for, for way too long. Um, mm-hmm. We only – 
had a documented investment philosophy roughly about four or five years ago. Okay. Um, closer to five years ago now. Yeah. Um, but from there, it's um, yeah, as, as as you put it, it's a it's a very good anchor. That's that's our center. That regardless of what happens, we have back tested it, and it that that philosophy because it's a philosophy. It's not. Yeah. It's not. It's not um, an investment approach. Yep. It's a. It's not a conviction. It's a philosophy. The philosophy does not change, and um, it has held up in pretty much every time period in history. And we don't actually foresee that to, you know, to really waver too much going forwards either. Yeah, because I mean, when you get that right, when you do really get to the core of something like that, the actual um, structure or fundamentals of the market would have to change for you to have to change the philosophy. You know, exactly. When you yeah. nail it, um, that's what that's what causes it to you to go, whoa, 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 whoa. Do we really need to need Correct. to rethink? Yeah, but I, yeah. you know, those sort of things are pretty unlikely. We've all got to watch for them, but they're pretty unlikely going forward. Um, okay, so I think it'd be great to sort of then talk through the outcomes. What you've seen happen is, you know, over time, as you know, from having this structure, how has it flowed out through the business? And I guess taking a lens from, I'd love to sort of talk through the key stakeholders, right, in the, in the business. Let's start with the advisors, right? So you you worker bees. I think I believe there's two of you. Is there two advisors in the in the practice? Yep, we've got two advisors and Perfect. four support staff on um, on the financial planning side of the business. Okay, so for the advisors, you know, on a day to day basis, what do you see as as the impact that having a really clearly enunciated investment philo- philosophy has had? You know, how has that flowed out in terms of either the workload or or you know efficiency, anything like that that you've seen in you know the fact that you've taken the time to do this. Um, I guess the practical benefits that we have um, seen and reaped would be um, for the fact that we we don't start second guessing um, ourselves. Right. That um, h- however we want to rebalance an existing client's portfolio, however a new client's portfolio would look like, um, that does not change too much. Yep. Um, and because you know of of the simple fact that as 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 you put it, unless something really fundamentally changes, I'm talking about like you know. The world realizes that capitalism is not the way to go, and communism right. is. So, like, it's 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 that drastic. Yeah. I, like anything short of that, that philosophy yeah. can actually work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, our, like our advisors, we um, we can actually, you know, focus more on what the clients' outcomes and um, like needs to be yep. in order to um, to fund and you know give them any sort of um, and and for them to to meet their financial goals. Yeah. Um, rather than you know. What like actually putting in a lot of time on um, rebalancing your portfolios because half the battle is won and half the work is done with yep. um, with a firm investment philosophy. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yep. And it, yeah, the, I mean the structure really makes a difference. And I think we probably we don't realize how often we re- we repeat ourselves or redo things until you bother to to take the time to put in place structure like this, and then you think, oh man, I really am. <laughs> Suddenly, these things are so much easier. Like, wow, I really was repeating myself a lot. Yeah. I'm curious then, and this is probably an unusual area to ask if there's been an impact, but I think it's worth touching on. Have you seen any impact for, say, the support team in having that structure? Has that flowed through to them as well? Uh, I would say that it definitely has, Peter, because um, because you know it's a philosophy that the advisors have come up with. Um, it you know it does not matter if. You know, the client that the support staff is working on is a client of advisor A or advisor B. It does not matter because both of us are on the same page. Yeah. Uh, both of us follow the same investment philosophy. Work can get passed to them knowing that the process, whether or not it's investments or our client process or how we charge our fees, what um, what the client would, would, would expect, um, that is consistent on an organizational level, yeah. um, which helps clients and also helps our support staff. Yeah. And that, I mean, it's one of, I think, the biggest challenges for practice is actually that translation from advisor and client relationship through to the people that implement. You know, like that yep. is, that's a, a struggle and can be very difficult. And we actually expect a lot of them, don't we? We really ask a lot of our support teams <laughs> to translate some potentially complex and convoluted either concepts or instructions. So, you know, if there is yeah. something that makes that easier, that handover easier, then that can be powerful. Yeah, uh, in a practice for, for sure. sure. All right, so let's talk about another sort of st- key stakeholder, I guess, or, or parties that we all interact with. How have you seen the impact with BDMs, whether it's fund managers or platforms or anything like that? You've got this, you know, well thought out 
um, philosophy now for investments. Have you seen that flow out in the way you interact with bodies like that? It has, um, for sure. And um, we have had better relationships with the BDMs for um, and with the fund managers that we actually use because um, we I actually had a had a meeting with a BDM earlier today um, that we have an, an investment philosophy and then we find the solutions for fund managers and investment solutions to actually fit our philosophy right. because um, you know if all it takes is a you know an, an impressionable advisor impressionable advisor and yeah. suddenly your investment and your your investment philosophy select fund manager selection and your port- portfolios might change drastically yep. that's um, that's never a good outcome um, but that's where we we have a deeper relationship. Um, with the funds that we use because they fit into our investment philosophy um, in terms of getting time in the day as well. I mean, you like you, you always run the risk of upsetting some BDMs because you will just not take take those meetings yeah. because uh, <laughs> we, yeah. we tell them that the fund that you're, you're in, um, it's just never a fund that would fit into our philosophy and sorry to upset you, but yeah. we, we, we're not going to meet you. And also, um, yeah, like there's no value of meeting us. <laughs> right, but I think you know there are so many funds, right? So you know, having the ability to, f- I mean, really, what you're providing them is a way to self-qualify, right? Here's a philosophy. If you think you can fit in this, tell me how that's the case. But let's do that before we meet. I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to ma- waste mine. You know, I think that's that's actually really powerful. You know, that's a good thing. Uh, we yeah, shouldn't underrate that, that, that the ability to right take another meeting yeah. off our list. Yeah. yeah. Because there's too many already. Yeah, yeah um, we're, not, we're not running, you know, with I probably run the risk of upsetting a few BDMs as well. But sure, um, yeah, but it's 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 true. Like you don't have, like, why you exist as an advisor is not to meet BDMs. <laughs> no, no, and it's so it's it's giving that way to sort of narrow that down. Um, exactly. And, and I'm imagining then too is that the the interactions with the people who do resonate with that or the the groups that do resonate with it can then enhance. Um, the philosophy they can add to that because they get it, right? They're going to get what you're about and why you guys are doing it and they can really step in and add value um, Absolutely. to that. Yeah. So then I'm, I am a little curious too about any um, flow on benefit from the perspective of your dealer group, right? So with the way in which you're authorized, you know, compliance, reporting, whatever that might be, um, do you think that that can make that process easier as well by having something that's a well-structured uh, investment philosophy? Yeah, I think um, we kind of overlook the benefits of that because we haven't had any issues with our dealer group, right? <laughs> and uh, that's 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 what we say in the office as well. And to add to our licensee, that um, it like a well like a good licensee is one that sits in the background and takes yep. care of everything for us. Um, yep. Whereas if we're if you're spending a lot of time dealing with your licensee, then that might not be the best fit. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, but I'm assuming then that you know, from their perspective, this is a tick. You know, this is just another thing that that gives them confidence and and you know, compliance teams confidence because there's there's structured thinking. Um, like you say, you know, and 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 we should you know we should admit I think all of us can be. Um, wooed by both charisma and great marketing materials, right? That's natural. That's why there's marketers, right? So it's it's why they exist. It's why these great Apple ads or all these things convince us to do to do things that other why am I spending eighteen hundred dollars on that new phone or whatever it is. Um the thing is as advisors, you know, having a touchstone like the investment philosophy lets you enjoy that meeting. That sounds exciting. Go back. Oh well wait a minute. <laughs> Based on our philosophy, I think I've got some more questions for that BDM, you know. So I think, you know, we've, we need to acknowledge that that's part of, you know, the process and, and that's how it works. So let's talk about the clients then, the impact on them. You know, how has it impacted the way you engage with them, um, the communications with them and, and, you know, have you had feedback, um, about the philosophy or how it's, you know, sort of worked from them, for them? Um, we have and, um, I, I mean, I, I don't want to jinx it. I, I prob- like I, I probably would have after yeah, touch, wood, touch, yeah, wood, yeah. <laughs> touch, touch a lot of wood. And um, yeah, we, we haven't had um, like a nasty feedback um, for for our investment philosophy because um, we're pretty upfront with our clients. If you know, we basically show them that this is our philosophy. Um, if you are, because you know, things like simple concepts of diversification yep. that is part of our, our philosophy. It's a good thing. It raises certainty, but we are also upfront that the fact that you are diversified, you will never ever see like those, you know, 
consistent. Like you will never double or triple your money in a right. space of, a, of of a short period of time. Right. Not speculative so, returns. It's not that exactly. Type of, yeah. So so those are the things that um, we are pretty upfront with with our clients because that that is the downside of diversification. You mm. are you are limiting your returns to increase certainty. Um, and if that's you know if a client is basically um, more of a risk taker than that, then that's um, that's either a part of their portfolio that we cannot help with, or mm. um, that is something that, um, well, if the client is like that and that's what they're chasing, um, unfortunately, that's um, not a client that we can actually take on board. There will be other investment brokers, investment advisors out there that might actually be able to help that. We are just not the best solution for them. And yeah, and I, that's a good self-selection process too, right? I think that's really powerful because better to find that out up front, yeah. right? Better to, for them to work out, hey, this isn't quite the right match. That doesn't mean – it's right or wrong. That means this is your vibe and the way you do things and therefore they need to feel comfortable with that. Um, that's a good process, even if the answer is no. Square peg, round, round hole. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And there's enough of different the different approaches out there that, you know, each client can find somebody that that works for them, you know, that yeah. really that they that they um they vibe on the same level, you know, and it and it sort of really um, matches what they're looking for. So similarly to all sorts of other approaches, you know, or lenses we use with investing, whether it's, you know, ethical or anything like that, they've got to find the right match. Um so the the strength with which you can push back on that, I think, is helped when you've got the philosophy there, right? Because it's like, yeah. this is it. This is how we do it. Um, you know, it's not about tailoring something unique to you um, in that sense. You know, yeah. it's yes, it is from strategy and, and all those sort of things, but this is the way we believe, you know, in investments. Um, Correct. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I'm imagining then that, you know, the listener advisors out there are sort of curious, you know, how the approach then – um, survived or performed during – we've had so much volatility. I mean, it's almost become a bit dull now. I mean, it's just – it's always volatile, right? I mean, it's – yeah. we'd probably all be concerned if, if markets calmed down for a period. We wouldn't know what to do with ourselves. Um, are you – have you been really comfortable with how your investment philosophy has helped frame the volatility for clients? Um, I would say very much so because yeah. part of our philosophy, that feeds into how we – construct and manage portfolios yep. um, and one part of it is um, it's a fund that thrives on volatility right. because um, it stems from our uh, philosophy that um, you know I think I think I've shared this before that if we, we, we tell our clients that if from here there on if there are 10 plausible scenarios that might play out from here um, but like regardless of what you talk about geopolitical risk uh, between Australia and China, more in Ukraine, inflation, interest rates, whatever it might be. Let's call it like 10 plausible scenarios that might pan out from here. The way that we position everyone's financial situation is to benefit from the majority out of them. Mm. So if you can benefit from seven to eight out of 10, you rinse and repeat that on a monthly, quarterly, yearly, three yearly, five years, yearly, 10 yearly basis, The benef- that's the benefit of our philosophy that we don't have to get it right to benefit from it because- who knows which one out of um, the 10 scenarios would actually play out. Um, but the benefit of it is that our margin of error can be pretty wide. Like it could be any one out of the, out of the seven or eight yep. um, to benefit out of it. And um, that's why we tell clients as well, who has a, who, you know, who has a geared property that um, within that asset class, you can't divers- diversify and hitch against interest rate risk because interest rate goes up as long as you have a loan against the property you wear the cost of it. Yeah. There's no other way to do it. But whereas for a diversified portfolio, guess what? There are sectors like the insurers and the banks that would um that would thrive on it. And yeah. it's it's not even an industry secret that the banks have reported really good profits in the last two years. Yes. <laughs> Disturbingly <laughs> so, so for many in the yeah. press. <laughs> <laughs> not, not 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 news that, you know, mortgage mortgage holders would want no. to hear, but uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, but that's the reality of it. And that's how we have um yeah positioned our like our clients situations in terms of their portfolios to to just benefit from majority of those scenarios, even if, you know, when there's not much volatility, what like so that's that's the event, mm-hmm. that's the cause, and what's what's the end result of it? Um, that you know we have a solution for that. As I said, that's that's a that diversified approach. It does suppress overall portfolio performance, but it does um, it does limit the bottom line of Damn. you know yeah. the highs are not as high, the lows are not are not going to be as low. So absolutely, 
Absolutely. And that touchstone, you know, consistent messaging makes a big difference. Exactly. So if they're yep. getting this consistent message, then they I bet your uh, there's a whole lot of your clients that can preempt how you're going to respond to a particular situation in terms of how you might explain it because they've just yep. they get used to that and that's powerful. Exactly. Um, and um, one one interesting part as well, Peter, that I would say is um, maybe we have over educated a lot of our clients when <laughs> um, when 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 there was like you know when when COVID happened or when there's a market sell off, um, the most common response that we had was um, our clients. One of one of one of our clients, he said that he, he wish he had more money to just dump into the markets because he saw it as an opportunity. And um, we've had you know three times more clients that saw downturns of markets as an opportunity than clients who were actually panicking as, as a result of it. Fantastic. <laughs> so fantastic um, yeah, job well done, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe 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 we should take with that back a bit. <laughs> Yeah, calm down, everybody. Calm down. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So then, you know, you guys aren't a huge, you know, you're not a, a 12 advisor practice or, you know, got 30, you know, 30 people teams. So I'm curious how sort of big the project was to implement the investment philosophy. Did this span over some months? Like how, how did it, you know, how was the rollout in that sense? I think the hardest part, Peter, was um, trying to, as, as you put it, um, trying to enunciate and articulate that into a document because um, as advisors, I, 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 I'm sure I'm not the only one who's um, who's a culprit of it, that we, we talk a lot better than we write. Right. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, um, so to find something that is concise into uh, like, and actually put it into a document that is, um, that was a bit of a challenge. Um, and we, I mean, we know what we know, but we just needed to make sure that um, finding the time for the ball, for two advisors to sit down and actually have that documented, um, it was a challenge, um, yep. but it was well worth the exercise. And have you gone as far as then, um, you know, prettying that up? Have you sort of gone to the point of almost brochurizing the philosophy or do you use it very much um, just, you know, internal and, you know, direct one-to-one -one with the client? We do. We we have it as an internal document yep. um, that we have. Um, like basically, the team can you know can articulate that it's yeah. um, it's a document that is available on our um, on, on on an open system in the mm -hmm. in the office. Um, and yeah, we we haven't really used that as a marketing material. Um, not because we. You know, we, we we're not protective of that by by any means, but mm. it's more the case that with that we are just trying to prevent client from clients from jumping to conclusions yes. without us actually having a proper discussion with yeah. them. Without because, the as context, I said, like yeah, that investment philosophy. Even before we go into the investments piece, um, we you know we 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 have to ascertain whether or not a client needs to invest in the first place because yeah. we have <laughs> I, we we have pushed away clients before that. By the time we drill down into um in, into what they actually need in terms of returns, it was just bank interest returns that they needed. Yeah. So um the, the the client actually came in for investment advice, and we told we told that the client that um you don't actually need any of this because obviously um Canberra being Canberra, we've got a lot of uh, government and public servants on yes. a very very brilliant defined benefit scheme with right. um, an index Oof. pension guaranteed for life, and um it's indexed to inflation as well. So um, that's money a lottery helps. ticket. That is, that's amazing. It, it, I, I wish I had one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So with that, that's already indexed to inflation. Uh, money outside of it. It was really just for estate planning. So we yeah. told them that there's we, after discussions, which was which is actually the value of 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 advice. That's it's through you know, the you know the conversations, the discussions with our clients that we have, um, and we've ascertained that we we can only disappoint that client, and yeah. we uh, we told them that we you know. Basically, churn term deposits, you get exactly what you want. Yeah. And that's why, you know, whether or not you need to invest or not and how you need to invest, um, that investment piece comes quite late into the discussion process, um, which is why we we don't want to have that document to be overly overt. Yeah, well, okay. Just, justified or unjustified, that's that's our approach. Yeah, no, and I think um it's important to lead you know, from a marketing, I'm saying that as a loose term, but from a marketing sense with with where they need to begin with you, 
Like it, yeah. it need, you need to lead with that. And if if it is an investment, it will be. There'll be some listeners that that it literally is the thing that attracts people to you, and you're using it that way. That's fantastic, right? But but if it's not, you know, I agree with you there. It would be a mistake for that to be the first, well, potentially a mistake for that to be the first entree to you because that's not where you guys are coming from, right? So that's not what you want to start with. So so why would you get the clients to do that? Was there, I'm curious in that, you know, you had the conversation with the other advisor, you guys pulled this together. Was there any surprises in that process? You know, anything that came out of either the discussion or, or the implementation or pulling together of the investment philosophy that was a surprise, um, that came out of that? They went, Oh, you know, I'm glad we did that. That was different to what I expected. I think the short answer would be no. Mm -hmm. Um, not, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll clarify to say that not to say that we do not differ on some of our investment opinions. Yep. We absolutely do. Um, we, but we generally still agree on 85, 90% of the things that of, of how we would invest for, um, for the same client. Yeah. Um, but in terms of philosophy, we, you know, it's, it's, it was very, very, um, in sync. Yeah. Perfect. Um, is, was there anything that was particularly challenging, you know, about any of the process, whether it was the actual documentation of the, of the, you know, of the investment philosophy or even implementing and rolling it out? Were there any barriers you hit that you had to really power through as part of that? I think, I think the main barrier was, um, trying to find something that is well thought through, but, but also, um, we you can't have it to be too technical, right? And you, we, you yeah, you, you basically have to find um, you know, if if a chart would tell a thousand words, we we you would we would definitely use a chart. Um, yeah, you you know, illustrations, graphs, those are very powerful tools. Um, because the philosophy, ideally, anyone should be able to pick it up. Um, you know, a nineteen-year-old receptionist that comes into um for for the first job in their lives. Should yep. be able to pick it up and roughly understand what you're talking about. Yep. Um, because that should not have, um, in our opinion, should not have a lot of technical jargon. Yeah, it shouldn't. And and it's um it's so important to to keep on trying for that as the target. Um, and you know potentially even getting somebody outside of the the two advisors, like the two of you to to hey take a look at this. Can you understand this? Um, is a good benchmark. You know because I think it's really important. It's actually what most people I don't think realize is it's harder to write with clarity. Anybody absolutely. can write 40 pages of absolute nonsense that doesn't flow and isn't easy to read, right? It's the hard thing is concise, you know, really concise and clear and easy to follow and and somewhat mesmerizing information. So, so yeah, it, I get that. I, I would agree with, with you that that's one of the hardest things of this process um, is clarity, making it clear. So, looking back then through the journey you've taken, is there anything that you do differently or that you'd, you know, for somebody listening that's maybe a bit, you know, not quite as far ahead as you are in this process that you'd say to advisors, hey, you know, you know, make sure you do this or, you know, I would have done this differently in our process to to get us to where we are now? Um, I think the only thing that I would give um, myself advice for, um, <laughs> you know, Leon five years ago was yeah. – um, you should have started this eight years ago. Right. <laughs> it's never too early to start. I yeah. know it is um it is a hassle because I was doing it and and at the same time, you know, at any point you are always working on five new clients and then you see that oh the time that you spend on investment philosophy that does not generate anything, you could be spending on these clients. Yeah. Um but I would say absolutely do it if you are umming and ahhing on whether or not you should be doing it. I, I, I think there is value whether or not you are a one person planner to a firm size of a hundred, there's always going to be value um with it because if you are a single planner firm um and you're working for yourself, that is that center and that's your ground zero that you can mm. always anchor back to. Mm -hmm. Um and you you know that just by reading it, you will not waver based on the market noise or or you know, any very, very Good charismatic sales people, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you can always refer back to a document that you have come up with. You know, if if your organization is has as a staff strength of a hundred, then all the more that you know you you should have a documented investment philosophy because anyone that comes on board, you know, I I can't imagine repeating this philosophy a hundred times. Yeah. Um, it's it's it should be nice and easy. Anyone who comes on board 
fresh into the industry should be able to pick it up and understand roughly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And I think probably even for new entrants, you know, somebody who's quite new to investment advice, there's no reason not to start doing that. Even if you're in the practice and they've got their philosophy and all that approach, just starting to work through that for yourself just helps you better understand where you're coming from. Because part of the philosophy is capturing your experience, what you've seen, why you believe what you believe, right? Exactly. So, the more you revisit this, you know, the better the better you'll be at it. Like you say, in five years' time. So yeah. you know, it's it's um you know it's you know plant the tree now, or you could have planted it a decade ago. You know, so <laughs> exactly. So yeah. for sure, I completely agree with you on that. That um, it's never and sorry, too early. Second thing as well, Peter, that um for anyone who um in terms of like you know recentering yourself and um having that as an anchor um it's not it's not just you know to if you if you run the risk of through some sexy marketing but um it's also for the fact that you you know that you won't relent anytime you get a difficult question from a client because that is your philosophy uh part of our philosophy is long-term returns and we you know quite overtly tell our clients that there could be a market drawdown there could be a lot of volatility for the next week but in the long run, this like it, it actually becomes irrelevant. Yeah, a, a two percent drawdown in the space of two days it really becomes irrelevant if you're investing for ten years. Yeah, so it's drop in the ocean, um, and you can refer back to it. It does also come through when you speak to your clients because you you, you say it with a lot more conviction. Your mm. clients um, get ac- actually get a lot more settled um, and. Believe it or not, um, it's subconscious and it really shines through. Yeah, it does because it becomes that that framework, doesn't it? It gives you exactly. that that framework and structure, and and like you say, helps and helps you reframe where the you know the client comes at you with something. Maybe it's a bit different. Hey, there's that framework. You can push that through. You know, you've got your philosophy, and that lets you sort of process um, that situation and then respond. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Any other insights or tips or anything like that you'd like to share with a listener about the philosophy? Is there anything you guys are like anywhere else you're taking this for the practice? Any ideas you've got of, of you know, do you think you'd, um, oh, I don't know, change this going forward or expand on it? Is there anything different that you'll do with the investment philosophy going forward? Um, I don't think there's much that will change with the philosophy. So, um, because as I said, like once, once you do it, you mm. can kind of back test it. You can, you can, or even, just brainstorming of what possible scenarios might actually play out that would, you know, make you change your investment philosophy. If there's nothing, then you have um, pretty a pretty watertight philosophy um, because that's 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 a philosophy. As I said, it's like you know, going through life when you have your own values and morals. That's similar to investment philosophy as well. Like things might come, might go. You might see, you know, something that might threaten your um your morals and your and your principles but if that is firm enough you are really quite equipped to um to tackle anything going forwards the 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 context um might change but how you approach it will not and so then it probably just becomes um you just maybe find different ways to communicate it you know so it just might be the way that you can share it with clients the tools you use to communicate it it probably is just down to that exactly might evolve over time yeah. Perfect. Look, Leon, thank you so much um, for sharing, you know, how you guys have done this and, and how it's impacted all the different parts of the business. You've been really generous with your time. I'm confident that this is going to be immensely helpful um, for any of the listeners, listeners who are really sort of taking another look potentially at that journey for them um, and are thinking about making it a bit more structured um, and pulling that together. So thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing to where it heads you in the future. My pleasure, Peter. You know, it's so interesting that even for a two advisor team, so, you know, that's a a sort of relatively small advice team, then taking the time to really enunciate your investment philosophy can still have a huge impact across the board, right, for the whole team, for your interactions externally, internally, you know, there's so many layers of impact. So, you know, I hope that message is coming through that that it really can be worthwhile um, taking the time to do this. Um, And if you are keen 
to get this started yourself, then there are some things that you can do that will uh, put you firmly on the right path. Step one, um, make sure you've joined the Ensemble online community. It is free. Um, so you just need to um, head over uh, to Ensemble, the website for Ensemble, and then you can join for free. Um, and what you'll find there is, of course, loads of resources, loads of conversations, your peers that you can ask questions of. But if you head um, your eyes to scan down the left of the screen, you'll actually see the Schroeder's Investment Education Space. And this is where Schroeder's has pulled together all sorts of information. There's posts and discussions by your peers about investments. You can search a particular topic, you know, if you want to get some information on duration, if you like anything you might be researching, you can look for. However, when you first sort of check it out, head over to the top section there in the Schroeder's Investment Education space. Along the top, you'll see there's some tabs. There's the updates. That's sort of the feed, the latest thing. But the next one is the resources hub. And that's where Schroeder's has curated all sorts of useful tools for you. There's articles, there's videos, there's interviews, um, there's even some sample client communications. But one of the things there is a white paper. It's called From Advisor to Philosopher. And basically, it's a step-by-step guide for you to go through this process of um, debating, enunciating, and implementing an investment philosophy within your business. So it's a great place to start. So I'd highly recommend you head in there. And honestly, you'll be stunned how much content is in there. And it's and they've really taken the time to make it um, worthwhile. Now, you can find all the links for all of this um, in the episode show notes, along with Leong's LinkedIn profile if you're keen to connect with him. See ya.